We Need to Talk, written by Philip Van Hooser, narrated by Gary J. Chambers. Chapter 1 Introduction I ain't getting no stitches. Just another day. The day dawned like every other day. From all outward appearances, this was just one more normal, predictable, chaotic day in the life of a young family. None of us could have predicted the lasting memory that would be made that day, or the value of the lesson learned from it. My wife, Susan, was busy with her morning routine of feeding, dressing, and generally tending to the needs of our two very active preschool children. Our three-year-old son, Joe, lived life in a state of perpetual motion. He had one speed, and it was always set at full throttle. Our one-year-old daughter, Sarah, was only slightly more sedate. On this seemingly normal weekday morning, Susan was in complete control of all matters of the home and of the hour. Like clockwork, resist as they might, the kids would be fed, dressed, and ushered next door for a day of fun and activity with their babysitter. With the kids appropriately delivered, Susan's focus would shift to her day job, which meant she would slip into her professional clothes before driving downtown to join me at the office of Van Hooser Associates, the speaking and training business we had built together. I must admit that my role was little more than that of a bit player in this ongoing performance of domestic theater. I had been instructed months before that the best thing I could do to help keep the wheels of daily progress turning smoothly was to stay out of the way, don't stir up the kids, and to let Susan handle the details. I also learned that if I left for the office early and without great fanfare, it made Susan's job of corralling Joe and Sarah much easier. So, on this seemingly routine, soon to be anything but, morning, I planted goodbye kisses on Susan, Joe, and Sarah before heading out the door. I thought I was going to work, but I was actually going to school, communication school. Little did I know that on this particular day, a doctor's office would become my classroom and I, the student. The Meaning of It As I closed the door behind me and headed for my car, I heard It. The It was a blood-curdling scream coming from inside my own house, and I immediately recognized It for what It was. Though kids certainly scream, holler, and cry in different ways, at different times and for different reasons, the particular brand of scream I'm referring to is never interpreted to mean I'm hungry, I'm sleepy, I'm mad, or I'm tired. The scream I heard that morning can only be interpreted to mean one thing. I'm hurt. And once it is heard by an adult, it means all other bets are off. Whatever the adult might be doing at the moment the scream is heard becomes secondary to the immediate needs of the child. You stop whatever you're doing and you turn your full attention to offering whatever aid might be necessary. In the Van Hooser household, on this particular day, that scream announced clearly that a seemingly routine morning had suddenly become anything but routine. It got my full attention. It meant one of my kids was hurt. It meant I was needed. As I rushed back into the house, I saw one-year-old Sarah sitting on the living room floor, looking slightly bewildered by all the noise and confusion around her. It was obvious she was fine. The process of elimination kicked in. It's not Sarah, so it must be Joe, I concluded instantaneously. But where is he and what's his problem? As I ran from the living room, continuing my search, I was met by Susan as she sprinted from one of the back bedrooms. Apparently, she had heard it, too and by the expression on her face, it was clear that she, too, recognized what it meant. We didn't speak. There was no time. We just kept moving. Together, Susan and I ran through the dining room before making a hard right turn into the kitchen in search of our little boy, and it was there we found him, standing dazed and frightened. Tears streamed from his eyes as blood streamed from his chin. It was an uncomfortable sight. Joe was hurt. As I bent down and scooped up my son into my arms, a jagged gash just under his chin became clearly visible. Through the blood, I could tell it was a deep cut. In fact, the cut reached all the way to the chin bone. Through a torrent of tears and hardly able to speak beyond his own gasps and sobs, Joe began trying to explain to us what had happened. The message he attempted to communicate came in bursts of incomplete, 
barely decipherable words and phrases. Nevertheless, I heard things like, Climb drawers. Want picture. I fall. Floor. My chin hurts. I sorry, Daddy. I love you, Mommy. Listening to Joe's sketchy, incomplete explanation while surveying the scene around us, Susan and I were able to piece together the following. As soon as Joe saw me leave, though he knew it was wrong to do so, he ran into the kitchen, pulled out the cabinet drawers, then climbed from one drawer to the next to the next, using them as a makeshift ladder. From the top drawer, he stepped onto the kitchen countertop. Once on the countertop, he balanced precariously, oblivious to the possible danger, stretching and reaching for a picture he wanted that was hanging nearby on the kitchen wall. It was then that he lost his balance and fell. In the fall, his chin must have violently struck the ceramic tile floor below. The blow resulted in what I loosely refer to as a split chin or gapper, otherwise interpreted as a cut serious enough that a common band-aid simply wouldn't suffice. As young parents, this was a first for Susan and me. We had never faced a situation quite like this one involving one of our children. Still, neither one of us was inclined to melt under the pressure at the first sign of a crisis. Our personalities and emotions weren't wired that way. Therefore, we simply went about the business of recognizing this situation for what it was, an unfortunate accident that needed our immediate attention. This was far from the end of the world, and we felt it important that we help Joe, even at his tender age, or more importantly, because of his tender age, realize that. As Susan removed Joe's bloodied shirt, I applied direct pressure to the wound using a damp cloth. With pressure continuing to be applied, Susan proceeded to wash the drying blood off Joe's neck, chest, arms, and hands. All the while, we talked calmly to him. In a few short minutes, we had stemmed the flow of both tears and blood. I placed a couple of temporary band-aids over the cut as Susan pulled a clean t-shirt on over his head. At that point, Joe seemed to take a quick personal inventory of his situation. He could see neither the wound nor its bloody remnants. His blood-stained shirt was nowhere to be found. His parents seemed to be acting as if everything was normal. From Joe's limited perspective, it all added up to one logical conclusion. He was healed. Of course, Susan and I knew better. We knew this ordeal was far from over. There was no sense pretending otherwise. In fact, the most unpleasant part still lay ahead. Joe needed stitches and to make matters worse, these would be his first. However, the gaping wound represented by his split chin couldn't be ignored. It had to be repaired. But Joe didn't know about the inevitable stitches, at least not yet. Should we tell him, we wondered? Would he understand? If we did tell him, wouldn't that just frighten him unnecessarily? If he knew what was going to happen, wouldn't that make the process even more difficult for the doctor? Joe is too young to comprehend all this, isn't he? Of course he's too young, I quickly convinced myself. We'll just wait and deal with all the unpleasantness that accompanies stitches when we can avoid it no longer, at the doctor's office. Joe, I said as calmly as I could, let's go for a ride. We'll let the doctor take a look at your chin and tell us what he thinks. Cat Whiskers Once Sarah was delivered next door to the babysitter, Joe, Susan, and I climbed into the minivan for the short ride to the local pediatrician's office. The more I thought about what was to come, the greater the sense of dread that enveloped me. This was one nightmare any parent would have preferred to avoid, but now that wasn't an option. As we entered the doctor's office waiting room, I realized how uncomfortable and inadequate I felt. Susan was the one who usually handles duties such as the kids' medical checkups. She was the one that was more familiar with this place. But this was a job for both of us, and I was not about to shirk my responsibility. Once inside, I encouraged Susan and Joe to take a seat near the door, well out of earshot from my planned conversation with the receptionist. They obliged, and I walked slowly forward and approached the receptionist's desk alone. Um, excuse me, I began haltingly. Good morning, sir. How can I help you? The receptionist's perkiness was in stark contrast to my current dismal state of mind. Yeah, um, my name is Philip Van Hooser. That's my wife and son sitting over there, I said, 
motioning over my shoulder at the woman with the little boy wiggling in her lap. His name's Joe. Well, you see, Joe fell and cut his chin a little while ago, I said slowly before leaning slightly closer and whispering, and he needs stitches. Mr. Van Hooser, I certainly understand, she responded knowingly. I need to tell you, though, that the doctor on call today is still making his hospital rounds. However, I expect him back in the office within the next half hour or so. Why don't you, your wife and son, wait in the examination room? You'll be more comfortable there, and as soon as the doctor arrives, I'll send him right in. Is that okay? Sure, that sounds fine, I muttered with little enthusiasm. With that, the young woman directed the three of us to a room down the hall, outfitted with the normal doctor things an examination table, two chairs, and a floor full of toys that any little boy was sure to love. As soon as we entered the room, Joe got excited. Spotting the toys, he immediately threw himself into his play with the exuberance and intensity that only a three-year-old can muster, his earlier accident now little more than a distant memory. Susan and I, on the other hand, were not nearly as excited to be there. While Joe played, we pulled the chairs close by one another and sat, speaking very little but later realizing that we had been thinking the same basic thought. Why was it again that we thought we needed children? Okay, I admit it was more than a fleeting thought. But I suspect we weren't the first parents in recorded history to have entertained such a thought briefly at one time or another under similar circumstances. We settled in and waited. After about thirty minutes, the door of the examination room suddenly swung open. In walked the person for whom we had been waiting. Though admittedly a stranger to us all, it was obvious he was the doctor. How could I tell? He was the only person in the room wearing a white lab coat, with a stethoscope draped casually around his neck. As he entered the room, my wife and I stood to introduce ourselves. Good morning, doctor. I'm Philip Van Hooser, I said, extending my hand to him. This is my wife, Susan, and over there, that's our son, Joe. When I had last noticed just before the doctor entered, Joe had been playing contentedly in the floor on the opposite side of the room. When the door opened and the doctor stepped in, my attention momentarily turned away from Joe and to the doctor. But now as I looked back to present Joe to the doctor, I realized Joe was no longer playing contentedly on the floor. No. Now I noticed that he was on his feet, staring intently upward, directly into the face of this stranger. The doctor's eyes quickly met Joe's. Hi there, Joe, the doctor offered warmly. With absolutely no hesitation, Joe crossed his little arms, stared defiantly at the doctor, and declared forcefully, I ain't getting no stitches. My son's proper use of the English language left much to be desired, but the clarity and resolve with which he delivered his singular message was nothing short of impressive, and frankly it caught me off guard. I admit hearing Joe speak up so quickly and directly was somewhat less shocking than the unexpected message his words conveyed. You see, I was absolutely certain that neither Susan nor I mentioned the subject of stitches to Joe. In fact, we had intentionally avoided the subject. However, it was now clear that Joe had some hidden reservoir of information, some sort of intuitive sense that until now had been unknown to us. In other words, our son knew more than he was letting on, and our son, our three-year-old son, apparently had a mind of his own, and he wasn't afraid to speak that mind. Imagine that! I pause here, wondering how many other times in our lives we intentionally tiptoe around sensitive issues, thinking that in doing so we are actually protecting some person from the harsh reality of the situation, when in reality, that person is already well aware of the situation, be it good or bad, pleasant or undesirable. Hearing clearly the words that Joe had spoken, I stole a quick glance at the good doctor. By all outward indications, he appeared unshaken by Joe's sharp retort. In fact, he spoke up quickly in response. Well, do you mind if I have a look at your chin anyway, Joe? He asked. Joe agreed to this simple request, and the doctor leaned forward gently removing the band-aids covering the cut. Once uncovered, the doctor surveyed the chin quickly before straightening back up. Now the doctor began shaking his head slightly back and forth, 
while stroking his own chin thoughtfully. All the while, Joe eyed him with suspicious curiosity. After several more seconds of silence, the doctor addressed Joe once again. Well, Joe, it looks like you've got a real problem, the doctor finally said in a very matter-of-fact manner. What is it? Joe asked curiously. Well, you said you didn't want stitches, but from what I can tell by looking at your chin, if we don't sew it up, the next time you start eating a pork chop, it might slip through that hole and fall out into your lap. Joe's expression in response to this thought was priceless. His eyes got bigger, his head jerked back slightly, and an innocent grin creased his lips. Joe wasn't expecting such a fun, casual response, and frankly, neither were we. Nevertheless, this non-serious comment worked its magic. It was immediately obvious that this doctor had succeeded in capturing our son's attention and imagination, and possibly his respect as well. The doctor continued, Joe, we need to talk. With those simple words, the doctor knelt down, picked my son up, and sat him on the edge of the examination table. Once Joe was seated, the doctor bent down and leaned in close, his face and eyes mere inches from Joe's. Though Susan and I stood nearby, Joe seemed oblivious to our presence, focused instead on this interesting doctor. It was then that the doctor started talking in earnest with his patient. Joe, I've been thinking. Your chin needs to be sewn up, but you said you didn't want stitches. So I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to give you stitches. No, sir, you're special. And because you're special, I'm going to give you cat whiskers. Cat whiskers? Cat whiskers! Hmm, that sounds interesting, Joe must have been thinking. But whether that's what Joe thought or not, there's one thing that was certain. The doctor knew how to hold a three-year-old's attention. He was a pro. And I was beginning to realize that the chances were pretty good that he had done this sort of thing before. As Joe continued to consider the concept of cat whiskers, the doctor spoke up again. But before I can give you those cat whiskers, it's very important that you know how it's all going to happen. With that simple statement and no further warning, the doctor reached into the pocket of his lab coat and produced the object that I had dreaded. It was a syringe. Exactly the same type of syringe that another doctor had waved in front of my face 16 years earlier following one of my high school football games. You see, I had been injured, a split chin, during the game. Yet, all these many years later, I still remembered the play during which I was hurt. I remembered the blood, and I remembered the needle. Oh, how I remembered the needle! And I remembered how it felt as the point of that needle entered the open wound in my chin, and the searing pain surged from the split in my chin to the soles of my feet. These long, suppressed memories surfaced quickly as I watched this well-meaning doctor holding his syringe in the air for Joe to see. No, 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 I thought to myself momentarily. Don't show him the needle. Sneak up on him. But this doctor had other ideas, and as I was soon to discover, his ideas were better. Joe, do you know what this is? He asked, holding the syringe so Joe could see it clearly. Joe nodded. It's a needle. That's right. Now do you know what I'm going to do with this needle? Not yet, Joe responded guardedly. Well, Joe, before I can give you those cat whiskers, I'm going to have to give you a shot with a needle like this in your chin. To be honest, I'll have to give you at least two shots, maybe even three. And Joe, I need to tell you, these shots are going to hurt but they won't hurt very long. How long? Joe asked. What do you mean? How long will it hurt? Oh, well now that's a good question, the doctor responded. Let's see. Can you count to ten? Yes, sir, Joe said with an obvious sense of personal pride. Well, Joe, by the time you count to ten, the shots will be over and it will quit hurting. After that, while I'm giving you the cat whiskers, all you'll feel are little tugs, just like this. The doctor demonstrated with a little pinch and slight tug on Joe's chin. See, that won't hurt a bit. Do you understand what I'm telling you, Joe? 
Joe listened carefully, apparently working to process both the good and bad of all he was hearing. I think so. Well then, Joe, there's only one other problem we have to attend to. What is it? Joe asked innocently. Well, it wouldn't even be a problem if you were a big boy. Big boys could do this job easily. But I don't know about you, Joe. You're still such a little boy, and this job is for a big boy. I don't think a little boy would even want to tackle it. Yeah, if only you were a big boy. The doctor went on and on, being intentionally elusive about the specific job to be done, while overemphasizing the important contrast between little boys and big boys. It didn't take Joe long to get a belly full of that. Joe was three years old, and like most of his three-year-old male counterparts, he was sick and tired of hearing all that little boy stuff. I'm a big boy, Joe finally declared emphatically. You are? Well, that's great news, the doctor exclaimed. I was afraid you weren't big enough to do this job, but you said you're a big boy and I believe you are. So, Joe, here's what I need you to do. I need for you to lie down on this table, put your hands under your butt, stick your chin way up in the air so I can shine this big light on it, and finally, I need for you to lie really still until I get you fixed up with these cat whiskers. Joe, do you really think you're big enough to do all that? Yes, sir. Great. Let's get started then. As an eyewitness to the entire event, with absolutely no more encouragement than that just mentioned, I watched as our three-year-old voluntarily laid down on the table, shoved his hands under his rear end, stuck his chin high in the air, and froze as stiff as if he were a statue. At about that same time, the door to the examination room opened, and in walked two nurses. I'd been expecting the restraining crew, Nevertheless, I couldn't bear the thought of Joe being physically manhandled or, worse still, strapped into a restraining device by strangers. For that reason, I had already intentionally positioned myself on the opposite side of the table from where the doctor would be working. Though I didn't look forward to the experience, I felt that if my son needed to be restrained in order for the doctor to do his work, it ought to be his father, not some stranger. But... Initially, at least, such concerns proved to be unwarranted. One of the two nurses did walk to the table. Once there, she positioned herself directly behind Joe's head, gently reaching up and placing her hands along each side of his temples. Now, let's be clear. Her job was not to restrain this little boy. There is no reasonable way she, or anyone else for that matter, could have restrained an excited three-year-old intent on resisting had she wanted to. No, she wasn't there to restrain him. Primarily, she was there to reassure him. Meanwhile, nurse number two took up a position near the door, standing quietly, calling no undue attention to herself. All the while, the doctor went about his business of preparing needles and cat whiskers, while still engaging his young patient in good-natured conversation. Eventually, all was made ready. The doctor approached the boy on the table. Joe, are you ready to get started? he asked. Yes, sir, was Joe's steady reply. Okay, then. As the doctor, needle in hand, approached Joe's chin, my heart sank. At that moment, I would have gladly volunteered to take a dozen shots in place of my son. But that's not the way life works. Difficulties are no respecter of age. Difficulties find us all and all of us must learn to face the difficulties we encounter in our own way. At the very instant that the cold steel of the needle pierced the open flesh of Joe's chin, as those nerve endings came alive, as the involuntary electrical impulses raced through the central nervous system on their way to this little boy's brain, as the brain collected the barrage of incoming information, instantaneously processing this information and ultimately determining that a pain reaction was justified, as all of this happened, Joe uttered an involuntary guttural moan. <clears throat> he said, Here we go, I thought, as I braced myself for the untold unpleasantness that was sure to follow. Then this single utterance acknowledging the pain Joe was feeling was followed shortly thereafter by nothing. That's right, nothing. No screaming, 
No crying, no fighting, no thrashing about in an attempt to escape, no movement of any kind. In fact, Joe never even took his hands out from under his little butt. He simply said, Ugh. But Joe's response triggered a counter-response by the doctor. The doctor began talking calmly, or to be more accurate, he began counting calmly. One, two, three. He counted slowly and out loud so Joe could hear him, as he continued to methodically inject the pain-deadening concoction. Four, five, six. When the doctor spoke the word six, Joe could hold back no longer. Seven, eight, nine, ten, Joe said loudly and more quickly, emphasizing by the pace and tone of his words his impatience with the doctor's slower-than-desired counting rhythm. If the period of the pain is directly related to counting to ten like the doctor told me, then let's count faster, Joe seemed to be reasoning. It was a light moment that arrived just when the tension was highest. Joe's unexpected response drew immediate chuckles from all of us gathered there in the room. Though his response was unplanned, even Joe seemed to appreciate that the least little bit of laughter could help the medicine go down, or in, a little easier. For the next 15 minutes or so, Joe proved more than worthy of big boy status and acknowledgement. During his entire time on the table, Joe continued to lie ramrod straight, hands securely beneath him, with his chin jutted forward as requested by the doctor. After the injections had been completed and the numbing effects of the medication had kicked in, the doctor proceeded to repair the wound with a grand total of five stitches, um, excuse me, cat whiskers. Throughout the surgical procedure, Joe engaged in friendly, light-hearted banter with the doctor and nurse, and all this without the least little bit of physical restraint. From my perspective, the scene that I witnessed was nothing short of amazing. When the doctor finally announced that the repairs were complete, Joe popped up on the table, looked at him once more and offered a polite, Thank you, sir. Yes, that's my boy. Obviously a chip off the old block, were a few of the admittedly proud, even self-serving thoughts that raced through my mind in that moment of wonder and triumph. The Power of Dairy Queen and Toys R Us I admit to being absolutely astounded by what I had been privileged to witness, it was obvious that Joe had performed magnificently, far beyond anything I could have hoped or imagined. My cup of fatherly pride was filled to overflowing as I watched and considered the way my young son had conducted himself throughout this unpleasant ordeal. But I must admit I was also confused, confused by things that had turned out very differently than I would have predicted at the very beginning of this adventure. Joe had behaved in ways that I simply had not expected. Why was that? What made that happen? Suddenly, an old leadership lesson came to mind. It was a simple lesson I had learned as a young corporate manager many years prior, and one that I had since shared with many of the leaders I had been privileged to train, coach, and counsel. Positive performance should always be recognized and rewarded in a public way in hopes that such performance will be repeated in private. That's exactly what I need to do, I thought. I need to recognize and reward Joe's positive behavior here today in hopes that he will remember and repeat such behavior in the future. I swept Joe into my arms and lifted him off the table. Susan and I both smothered him with hugs, kisses, and positive reinforcement. Now what can I do to reward Joe's behavior that will make him want to do it again? I wondered, as we drove from the doctor's office back home. I know. I'll take him to Dairy Queen for ice cream, and then we will make a trip to Toys R Us for some sort of special toy. I shared these thoughts with Joe, to his obvious delight. I promised him that later that day, when both of these businesses opened, we would visit them together. It was the least I could do for the hero of the hour, my son Joe. Soon the three of us were home again. Once there, Susan quickly decided her time would be better spent on this day at home with her kids instead of in the office with me. She was convinced that Joe needed an extra helping of TLC, and she was the perfect one to provide it. 
Joe and Sarah were thrilled to have Mom all to themselves. Conversely, I couldn't wait to get to the office. I had an unexpected task that had been dropped into my lap. Now it was time to wrestle with it. The task before me needed some focused, uninterrupted thought. While this whole unbelievable experience was still fresh in my mind, I needed to sit down and figure out exactly why Joe had performed so heroically.